Hey, welcome back. Um, we are in our interactive music symposium. We have the first presentation uh, delivered already. It went super smooth. The content was fantastic. So things are running exactly as we wanted it to be. Um, so now we're arriving at our first panel, which is a uh, titled Music Outsourcing Workflows. I believe that's that's the topic at least that's the subject um, and here's a perfectly balanced panel where we have uh, Richard and Chance as composers and content providers and James and Andrea which are the contractors or, or the client and the discussion will be focused on the relationship and collaboration during the critical stages of the production so uh, be it like pitching for a project and selecting a composer or a production studio, uh, the communication and file deliveries and implementation and revision and iteration, you know, all of that um, business logic going on between uh, the content providers and the people contracting them. So uh, Richard will be moderating. So Richard, I'll let you uh, present people and and basically take control over that panel and we'll meet again uh, after the Q&A uh, later. So thank you very much for being there, all of you. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Simon, and thanks everyone for watching. Um, yeah, I think we've got a great lineup here. Um, as Simon said, we're gonna be talking about the workflow between composers and kind of in-house developers and publishers. So I'm gonna let everybody introduce themselves and just tell you a little bit about what they do and what their day-to-day -day is. Um, and yeah, I'll kick it off. So I'm going to be kind of moderating and also representing the outsourcing workflow side of things. But uh, my name is Richard, and um, I own a company called Hexney Audio in LA, and we have like 21 sound designers and composers in-house. And so while I don't do any composition anymore myself, I uh, kind of negotiate all the deals for our composers and handle all the production side of things along with our production team here. And um, so I have a really good perspective, I think, of that, you know, working with a number of different developers and publishers representing a few different composers and kind of all, that whole process. Um, yeah, why don't we uh, have Chance introduce himself next? Thanks, Richard. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chance Thomas. I'm a full-time composer, although I'm actually heading towards retirement at this stage of my career. Um, I've also served as an audio director I was an audio director for EA Games. I was an audio director for Sierra Tell and a music director. So I've been on both sides of the fence and um, had to manage budgets and work with contractors and then worked with audio directors. So I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And um, yeah, on the in-house side, Andrea, why don't you, uh, yeah. Andrea. Sure. Andrea? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Andrea. Yeah. All good. Yeah, um, so my, I'm. I've got the French going on. <laughs> all good. We're all meeting each other for the first time. <laughs> um, I'm Andrea Chang. I'm the audio director at High Res Studios. Uh, previously, also worked at EA and at Microsoft. Uh, currently at High Res, um, my job entails supervising all of the audio for all of our games and all of our cinematics. So that includes sound design, music, VO, um, for like three games and all of the other games that are art, art that are in development as well as all of um, the cinematics. And uh, also just leading the audio team of internal sound designers, technical sound designers, programmers, um, and working with our outsourced audio vendors, so including composers for the music for our games. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I do. Very cool. And do you do any music production in-house? Um, I, if the delivered music does not work, then I, I step in and do it. So both for music and sound design. Uh, yeah, pretty much I just do what can't be done or the things that people don't want to do. <laughs> so, yeah, Makes but, sense. you know, okay, whatever. Cool. But no dedicated, like, full-time composers. Yeah, we don't have dedicated full-time composers. Yeah, but Hexany helps us a lot with our music. So, yeah. <laughs> cool, sounds great. Cool. Awesome. James, yeah, why don't you tell us about what you do? Yeah, so I'm a music director at EA Create Audio, which is a service group within EA. Uh, and we primarily serve as sports titles within EA and uh, the uh, titles in Motive and the Full Circle. 
at the moment. Um, so primarily I'm defining creative outcomes uh, for the tech needs, uh, or internal tech needs, and also handling conversations with composers and artists uh, with Worldwide Music, which is our primary music group based out of LA. Cool. And just to understand a little bit about James, your team's role with, you know, I mean, so EA is a publisher, but they also have in-house, you know, development studios. And so an in-house development studio might reach out to your group and then you might help connect them with an external composer or what, how does that relationship with, with the two parties work? Yeah. So it's interesting because worldwide music uh, handles most of the actual agreements and a lot of the connections around composers. Uh, but we still search for people who are appropriate on our own. So I'll generally work with dev teams and represent their needs to worldwide music. And then worldwide music will go and find uh, appropriate people. But in that process, we often bring names that seem to be in the right world for us. We'll drop names that you know people like yourself have sent uh, material to us just to kind of share and stuff that hits the mark to help us, I guess, uh, understand what the real needs of the dev team are and explain them to worldwide music. Awesome. Very cool. Well, that all sounds great. Yeah. Um, so feel free folks, you know, uh, if you have questions here, I'm going to be getting a digest of questions coming in. Um, and we're going to kind of, you know, uh, potentially address those throughout the panel, um, if appropriate, or potentially wait till the end, if, if more appropriate then, but feel free to submit them and I'll be keeping an eye on any questions and we'll, We'll try and address them as we as we hit different topics, but yeah, I say um, yeah, let let let's dive in first to finding composers. So, um, Andrea, you guys sometimes obviously need music produced, and there's a ton of composers out there. Um, where do you where do you start? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you do meet a lot of people throughout. You know, well, I. A lot of my bass composers, I went to USC Film Scoring School, so I've had a lot of my former classmates um, who are now doing great in the industry, um, working on projects. Um, but, you know, I've also worked with composers working at different game studios. Um, and, you know, you know, I meet a lot of composers also at conventions, um, and I always try to check out uh, everyone's reels because there's just a lot of different styles of music that are needed and um, you never know you might just meet someone who's just like hitting that specific niche um, but yeah it's just good to have a big composer pool so yeah pretty much the TLDR answer I guess is um, you know from past experiences um, as well as uh, people who are networking with me at different events and yeah or virtually. Yeah, that makes total sense. James, yeah, I know you said you have kind of the worldwide music group that does a lot of that outreach, but I, I guess yeah. I'd be curious, um, thoughts as well? Definitely. I, In I terms agree of... with Andrea there. Yeah, that... Sorry, there's a delay. I was, I'm always, just going to accept a large there's a little delay and, <laughs> and do my best to not <laughs> step on everybody's it. toes. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with Andrea that... Um, there's a lot of people that I have like one-on-one -on -one communication with uh, composers that I know and people that I've disconnected with over the last few years. And we're always, uh, I'm always reviewing demos as well and trying to get a, a sense of where everyone's at and where I could actually fit them in as, pro as the projects progress. Um, one thing we also do is have a music work group series where we invite people to come and share what they're doing and how they do it. So the development teams themselves get to have kind of a first-hand one-on-one -on -one experience with the artists, which uh, is really great for, I guess, just building uh, building those connections, right? When the yeah, when someone's working on something, they may be like, oh, that fellow that we were, that you sh showed uh, earlier in the year, like he had a certain style, I think would be appropriate for this, and we, I just facilitate those conversations really wherever I can. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, yeah, it seems like there's definitely that, that personal component, I think, in both of your, your you know, processes. Um, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, people want to know who they're working with and know that they're reliable and, and things like that. So there's more than just that the, the outcome when you hit play. But um, Chance, so you've, you've been doing this for a while now. And I'm curious, 
how has this changed for you in terms of finding the people you work with? Or has it been the same over the course of your career? You know, where do you find the, the developers and publishers that you work with? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Richard. Um, obviously, personal relationships are huge. When I was first getting started, a friend of mine said, it's not what you know, it's who you hug. And <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. You know, it's the people that you know well. It's people that you, um, that you trust and people who trust you. Although, um, when I was an audio director at EA many years ago, um, I would occasionally put out a broad cattle call through Gang, which is the Game Audio Network Guild, um, just to see, just to shake the bushes a little bit. Maybe I was on the way that I used Network Guild Awards. I'm not sure. I would listen to all the music submissions. You know, I'd listen carefully. And wow, so, you know, every once in a while, some new composer that I wasn't aware of would come to the surface with something fabulous. And I, I think from that perspective, as somebody's looking for music and looking for composers, it's important to be constantly expanding your network. Um, but again, from a freelance, let's get back to a freelancer's uh, point of view. When I would go to the Game Developers Conference, I would always try to make appointments with audio directors ahead of time that I hadn't met yet. And those that I had met, I think of being successful as a composer in the game industry is building relationships with people who are in a position to hire you. And you do that with your friendliness and you do that with the quality of your work. Yeah, that makes sense. That, that's been my experience as well. And I know a lot of people email me pretty regularly asking, you know, how do you find work? How do you find these clients? And I, and I especially in the last year and a half, have felt bad giving the answer. It, it's for me and for us, it has been those personal relationships. And so it'll be interesting to see if that you know, changes into more digital format and, you know, if, with over the next year and whatnot. But um, yeah, I, I think that's been my experience as well, largely. And for us, um, you know, it's largely returning clients and referrals are the main sources of, uh, of new work for us. A lot of referrals, some, some hits on Google and whatnot. But uh, for us, it's definitely referrals. And I, I think that just, you know, speaks to the importance, again, of impersonal relationships. Um, but yeah, I also think it's a great segue, uh, Chance, in terms of, you know, once you, you know, if we assume personal relationships at conferences and things might be a good way to make an initial introduction, what, you know, makes you end up picking someone is what I would be curious, um, Andrea, you know, when you, when you have these people, what stands out? when someone is being selected? Is it their music quality? Is it the fact that they work in games and not film? Does that come into play? What pops out to you? Yeah, I would say that um, the music ultimately speaks the loudest to me uh, because sure. that is the end product, right? Um, but obviously the human portion is important too, right? Like if someone is a brilliant composer, but it's just really hard to work with, that, that could also be a deal breaker. Um, and, you know, just the whole process of it, right? Like, uh, how do they receive feedback, right? I think that is a big portion of it because more likely than not, you're not going to hit like exactly the best version of what we're trying to target for the music within the first shot, right? Um, and so how do you tackle revisions, right? How, like, you know, do you get defensive by the feedback, right? Um, it's just like really having the mindset of being collaborative um, and easy to work with, right? And understanding that the project's needs come first and it's nothing personal. Um, you know, I, I know that a lot of times it's easy to get attached to the music, right? Um, but, you know, also just t thinking it from uh, the developer standpoint, right? They, they've been creating this baby from, you know, for how long, like nine months, right? Um, and so, you know, understanding like that dynamic and uh, just being a good team player um, is really important. 
uh, and just, yeah, understanding the feedback and, and making sure that each iteration really addresses the, you know, the points that didn't hit the first time and, um, you know, a asking questions, right? Like if you don't understand or you're not exactly sure, um, you know, being bold and just like being like, okay, I want to make sure I'm doing a good job and understanding clearly and communicating, right? Like I think communication is also key. Um, so yeah, you know, a lot of the key characteristics that you look for in um, anyone you want to work with, right? Like being a decent human being. Um, I think all of those yeah. are important in regards to, uh, you know, whether if you if you need to have game experience um, or if you're just like into lin linear media, I think that's a little less important. Um, it is it is good to have knowledge of games and how they work and implementation uh, because it provides context to how you write the music. But ultimately, like if the music is good, you know, our internal team can also handle like structuring it, um, you know, to fit the game. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Great. Chance, did you have Richard, can I piggyback on? Yeah, can I piggyback on something that Andrea said? She was talking about revisions. And <laughs> we're, we're not just composers, we're recomposers. I mean, every time I submit a piece of music to a developer, it's, you know, V1 with the expectation that there's going to be V2, V3, you know. We, we're not just writers, we're rewriters. And that's actually one of the glorious things about collaborating. Idea, but then you get these other ideas that come in, and that creativity generally ends up delivering something that's better than anyone could have imagined on themselves. So I love the revision process. And and I'm curious, Chance, yeah, while we're great. here. Well, actually, let's go. Uh, we'll come back because I have a question for Chance. But James, yeah, yeah, uh, hit us with your. You've got your composer pool. What makes you stand out? And pick someone. What are the skill sets you're looking for? Oh, I mean, it really is really aligned with uh, Andrea's thoughts there too. It's primarily, obviously, the music has to be something that feels appropriate. But after that, it is all about the communication in that process. Like if someone, if someone isn't willing to work with us, and it it's just not going to work at all. And and just to add to that, I, I don't really care what they work in, whether they're familiar with games or whether they're film only people. Generally, someone who can communicate and is into the collaborative aspect. They can wrap their heads around what is needed. We can explain the pieces and break it down. It just takes a bit more work on our side to break it down and explain how we use the, the material. But uh, it's, yeah, quality and personality, two prime pieces. You gotta be ready to respond to whatever the needs are because we're all so hyped about making something, right? And we wanna work with people who are as excited about it as well, exploring the undiscovered areas too. and. Sometimes that means going down a little bit of a rabbit hole only to realize that we have to back up out of that. Uh, people who are into like actually exploring are definitely really high on the list. Awesome, yeah. And I think everyone's touched here too a little bit, you know, with the film thing. Um, we will we will dive into middleware and the role of your composers and middleware in a little bit, um, just so everyone knows. I've seen some questions there too. But um yeah, no, that makes sense. So, so Chance, I'm curious, as you are, you know, working with folks, when you when you come onto a project, do you find the need to set expectations to help get that feedback process like streamlined? For example, with our company, if we come in and there's no internal audio director or internal audio team, I'm very clear to ask at the beginning usually who is going to be the point of contact, who is going to be providing the feedback. And sometimes the answer is like our entire design team. And I'm like, <laughs> this probably isn't the best way. Um, so do you do anything to kind of set that up for success at the start of a new project if you think it needs it? Absolutely. Uh, it's critical for a freelance composer to identify right at the beginning of the project, who is the vision holder? Who is the vision holder who's going to communicate to you what the team It's not trying to give you feedback and you get feedback from five, six, seven different sources. It is important to identify to create a funnel, a funnel between you and the team so that there's clarity. The other thing I like to do in my uh, contracts is to put a limit on the number of official revisions. That, that's not to uh, squelch creativity, 
but it is to make sure that we're using our time and they're spending their money efficiently so that, you know, my team doesn't get completely ground into the dirt, you know, chasing lots of different rabbit holes. We don't mind going after one rabbit hole, maybe a little bit down too, right? <laughs> but you don't want to be pursuing 20 different rabbit holes on your way to um, finding a great school. Yeah, no, that's a great yeah, point that, about that, the contract. That is a good point. Yeah, our, our company <laughs> sorry, actually sorry. doesn't limit revisions. No, the delay. Our company doesn't limit revisions. Um, we do say, uh, you know, within reason and on limited number of revisions, as long as scope isn't changing. Um, and generally, we don't really exceed what we would have wanted to do anyway. And I think for us, people like that that feeling of security, even if they don't take advantage of it, that they could have more. But I, I know a lot of people do both ways. Um, and I'll also add that in addition to the vision holder, I think it's important to ask if there are other stakeholders above them that are, will also be beholden to, because sometimes, especially with existing IP, there's other companies and people at play that you need to be prepared for their opinions coming in. Um, and, uh, but yeah, good stuff. Cool. Um, I just want to mention one thing that Chance yeah, touched on there, that uh, there's definitely a, a big piece that I work with is that at that point where you're identifying the funnel, right? Like who is it who holds the, the vision, like you said, who is it that is going to give the feedback and my own awareness of the artist and the dev team and being able to translate that feedback into something that will make sense to them, help them understand. And sometimes a lot of the dev teams have a vision. They don't quite know how to respond uh, in musical terms to an artist. So that's a big piece of uh, what I do as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So yeah, so James, uh, Pivoting a little into the deliveries and the expectations with middleware and whatnot, you know, I know sound designers are very much expected nowadays, much of the time, to be implementing their sound in, be it wise or natively in the game engine. Um, but composers always are asking me, do we need to know how to implement our own music? So what does music implementation look like? on the projects you've been in? Who is implementing it? Is it in-house at EA? Is it a sound designer? What, what does that look like? Yeah, it's, it's almost entirely in-house. Uh, our tools aren't easily accessible to anyone out, out of house. We do have contractors who do work like that um, for long-term, depending on the project, but primarily in-house. I'd say comp for composers, working with middleware, or at least playing with a bit, can be really beneficial creatively. It helps you wrap your head around what is possible. Like you could take a 30 second piece of music and create several segments out of it with variations for each segment. And that little 30 second loop could be randomized to last for five minutes and not, you know, not be exhausting to the ear. So there's little, there's all these different little pieces that, you know, if composers are working with those tools, you're just exploring with them, playing with them. It helps them wrap their head around what is possible. Uh, makes our job a bit easier, and I think it, yeah, you know, it, it can reveal kind of cool, creative, um, great places to explore for the composer. But the actual implementation right now for EA is all in house, so that's why we get into breaking it down to the pieces that we need for a composer. And often we'll just say, look, just give us the stems. We will just take take the elements and split them as we require, or re-edit as we require, like Andrew was suggesting earlier. Yeah, that was my next question. What are they delivering? And yeah, stems. And, and that's been our experience too. Um, our composers don't generally implement um, their own music. There are definitely some projects where we do do in-house implementation of music. But for us, we like our composers to know how to use it. They get WISE music or WISE certified at a basic level. And, um, and then we usually deliver a text file that says like, there's this many bars of pre-roll, here's the tempo, here's this to make that implementation process easier. Um, Andrea, so yeah, what about at, on your side? Do composers do any implementation for you? Uh, no. <laughs> so yeah, similarly uh, to James, like we do everything internally. Um, but yeah, I think it is important for a composer to understand like how to use WISE uh, at a base level. You don't have to be a pro or anything at it, but just understanding like the tools that will be used to um, you know, trigger the music in, into the game, right? Uh, it's, I would say the content is half of the experience and how it's played and how it's triggered is the other half, you know? So um, I, I think that, uh, you know, 
you can also destroy a piece of music that is a beautiful piece of music if it's not implemented correctly, right? Um, so just understanding it for context, I think, is super important. Um, you know, it may also change how you tackle writing music, right? Like if you're like, oh, this is a bit more modular, right? And you know, um, you know, I can like have th this layer won't always be playing, right? Or this layer may come in later. Um, just having an understanding of just the dynamic element of your music is really helpful. Yeah, no, that makes that makes total sense. Chance, um, yeah, have you tell me talk to me about implementation, middleware, all that goodness. Okay, so first I want to comment from a historical perspective. You know, James was talking about, yeah, it's important that composers get a little bit of an understanding of whys so they know what's possible in terms of interactivity. Well, back in the 90s, when we were first writing music for games, we were telling technology developers, well, here's what we need. Here's a function that we need. In other words, we would dream <laughs> up active approaches to music and give those ideas to technology developers. So it's fun to kind of see this come full circle. Um, I have only actually implemented music myself in a very small handful of games. For the most part, it's like what Andrea and James were talking about, and even you mentioned it, Richard. Most audio development teams want to have that fine tuning capability. Um, and I'm happy to give that to them, right? Because you know your game inside and out. But it is critically important for any composer, I think, working in interactive to have an understanding of music design. How can we make music come alive, respond to the game, stay fresh, stay relevant for the entire experience? Um, Richard, I'm not hearing you. Muted, I, don't Richard. Me. I think you're muted. Sorry, my digital <laughs> mute button. I've been. I love my digital <laughs> mute button that I forgot to undo it. Yeah, no, I, I think that all uh, that all makes total sense. If composers email me this question all the time, so it's great to hear kind of a unified front on this. Everybody thinks it's important to know how at a basic level and know how the systems work. Um, and maybe that even means, you know, kind of learning wise, but kind of getting deeper into to scripting and, uh, you know, blueprints if you're on real or things like that probably isn't something that a composer uh, for games nowadays is going to use on a regular basis if you're freelance. Um, again, every situation is different, especially in the indie world. I want to acknowledge everyone here is kind of working um, on projects with in-house teams that can support potentially external composers. But there's certainly a world where, uh, you know, a lot of indie projects, the composers are potentially expected to do that implementation, um, potentially mixing and everything themselves within the game. I've absolutely seen that. So I want to definitely acknowledge that is a very real thing for a lot of games and um, just kind of depends on what projects you're working on. Cool. Um, yeah, this is a great question uh, from Vincent Diamante. Are there any key are there key features in a project that make you decide how much to develop internally versus externally? I imagine that depending on the game and the parties involved, you know, different levels of support are required. So I, I, that's a, yeah, interesting to see. You know, what makes you decide to outsource something? I guess for for you guys, you don't have in house music, so that's a big part of it. But um, yeah. you know, are there are there things that would make you want to use a composer? over a library you know everybody still seems to be doing a lot of custom work and and what drives that i guess andrea i would say like uh the amount of customization needed uh is a big part of it um you know like library music yeah you can use it it's it's fine for cinematics and promos but you also run into a lot of licensing issues in game uh, if you don't have the proper licenses, especially if you stream your game, right? Uh, players may complain about the music being muted when they stream. So there's just like a lot of legal issues there. Um, but in general, though, I think that I turn to, uh, compo or even if I did have an in-house composer, I think I would s freelance things that are more, more niche um, that require a certain level of craft and ability um, so that that would be my piece of advice too, is like really determining what 
you're known for is important because, you know, you want people to be like, oh yeah, this is the horror guy. Like I'm going to contact so-and-so for these types of projects. Right. Um, I think it's good to have a base level of like, uh, I can, you know, be pretty competent in all areas, sort of, uh, you know, I can, I can write in all styles to a certain degree, but also just really zoning in on the area that you're known for and that um, people will hit you up for. So, yeah. I think that's an amazing <laughs> point. I'd love to pivot that to, to, to Chance and James as well. Chance, specialties, how important is it for a composer to specialize? And then also conversely, is it easy to get pigeonholed into the person that only does horror? And then you're like, when can I score a non-horror game? Yeah, we definitely get pigeonholed. Um, and I think the only, well, let, let's look at both sides of that because it's great to have a pigeonhole. That's why people know what to pigeonhole. And I again. think one way, what, what's that, Andrea? Oh, no, sorry, you were cutting out, so we were trying to guess what you were saying. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was saying it's great to have a pigeonhole but it's also great to break out of your pigeonhole. And I think the way that a composer breaks out of their pigeonhole is you target a game that you wanna work on that's different from the kind of stuff that you've done before. You get to know the audio director and you create the most Rich. off guard, Rich. that can open Rich. the door You're for muted. you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I was trying to fill in for chance. I think we all got the idea. Yeah, no, no. Pigeonholing yeah. uh, is is uh, a real thing, but I think that was great advice, Chance, in terms of you know finding a project, doing it, showing everyone you could do something else. Yeah, I think that's where what we got from that. <laughs> yeah, cool. and I, mean, I would add. Yeah. If you think, oh, sorry. Go on. <laughs> I'm just gonna say I would add that uh, the pigeonholing is really valuable. If these days, there's, there's so like the barrier to entry for music is so low. It's so easy to produce really high quality material that defining something about what you do and having that, you know, it's a pigeonhole perhaps to begin. But later on, uh, as you develop those relationships, which I think is what Chance was getting to, is that you have that relationship. You, you the person relies on you, and they they're more willing to let you explore other areas at that point right like hey yeah, I think like, that's really you did cool. awesome on that horror piece but uh we're doing this high energy electronic thing now do you want to like demo for that particularly that particular style and then just go off so it is really about defining something that you can just be known for and then using the relationships you build out of that i think to uh, to expand out totally and, and james all the music that EA purchases from composers, I assume, work for higher buyout, not really doing license deals. Is that accurate? Uh, we do license a lot of music, actually. Like it's. I guess that's I mean, in terms of the like an interesting work, sorry. custom work. Sorry, yeah. I, I guess yeah. yeah. If you're hiring a composer to do something custom, that's going to be a work for hire buyout generally. Yeah, and but it is interesting now because there's a bit of a shift, like working in sports, uh, especially. There's more of a shift to more, like, I guess, like modern electronic hip hop or pop based score, and mm -hmm. and when you get into that space, it's like the people who do that best are the people who are making those those hits, which normally you would license. So we've totally. we've been exploring working with people in that space, mm -hmm. where we may license a track that we like and have them, you know, remix or rework it to create kind of a, a score experience there. Um, so it's really interesting right now. There, there's a bit of a, a bit of a shift going on, the expectations of what a score even is. Like it, you, could, you could make it out of entirely licensed tracks where you work with the original artists and have them you know, remix or rebuild them. So it's kind of a pseudo remix slash license kind of thing going on um, that we've been looking at recently in sports especially. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, an, it's a cool shift to yeah. see. Andrea, same, we also, same story? <laughs> yeah, we work with a lot of licensed artists and bands and music too, um, because 
yeah, our company likes to do a lot of crossover deals. And um, I think it's really exciting to be able to do that. But then, you know, obviously more stakeholders mm -hmm. <laughs> when that happens. Um, but yeah, it's like, you know, a it opens the opportunity to work with pre-existing music in a creative way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very different way of thinking of composition, I think, like, um, you know, and also like crossing the boundary between score versus song, like kind of what James is alluding to, to, I think is, is very common now, um, where it's like, you know, is this more of like a song structure or is it more like, you know, typical film scoring type? And, and I think we're shifting more towards uh, the latter. Or yeah, I, the former. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to see you both say this because, like, thinking about it, we also do a ton of stuff in that. You know, people will license something, and then we often our team gets brought in to do all the supporting music. You know, maybe there's like some track in a specific style, and we've even done this for high res. And then you know, we'll create additional things in that style to kind of support maybe some licensed track that's the, the headline feature. We'll do the interactive components. So yeah, that's a great. Right. That's a great point. Um, Chance, uh, thoughts on that? And also the original question was work for hire. Have, have the projects you've done, Chance, also been largely a work for hire rights buyout? Definitely early in my career, almost everything was a work for hire. But as I've learned more, I've learned that music copyright is kind of like a little cup full of pencils, right? And every pencil represents a little right a different right that copyright covers. And I've actually learned that most developers and publishers only need a few of those pencils. And so when I structure a deal now, I'm giving them all the rights that they need, but I'm retaining. This is a terrible place to have chance cut out. We're definitely going to come back to this. Chance, you cut where, out where the rights that you want to retain in a deal. So we got the pencil cup. What are the rights that a composer like you wants to hang on to in a deal? So first of all, you want the writer's share of performing rights royalties, which no publisher can ever collect ever. And no publisher ever has to do any work to collect either. So hang on to the writer's share of performing rights royalty. Um, really, you want to hang on to the rights to exploit music outside of the game industry. So I would I tend to license to a game company um, a non-exclusive, well, exclusive to the game industry, um, with no term with it. Old so that they can use use the music in their game forever. They want to know that they can advertise with that music. They want to know that they can make sequels with that music. And if they sell the assets, they want to know that that right is transferable. So those are all the pencils that game companies usually need. But very few game companies are going to exploit the music as a music product. Um, and so anything that falls on that side of the equation, if you're inclined in that way in the business, hang on to those. And that's what I do. That's interesting. Damn yeah, that. that's great to hear you have been able to hang on to that. Um, personally, I, I haven't found many deals where we've been able to to hang on to kind of ancillary rights um, outside of, you know, the game for additional other uses. I'd be curious, James, Andrea, um, is that something you let composers do? And it's okay if that's not in your purview of stuff. I'd say personally, I, that's okay. something that I will... Sorry, I'll just jump in quick. Uh, personally, that's okay. something that I like to advocate for because you know, artists, it's hard being an artist. It's just, it's incredibly challenging. And I think anything that we can do to allow them more freedom with their music, um, I think that's part of the reason why that idea of the licensing slash remix idea uh, was really interesting to, me as well, interesting to me as well, because the artist can actually, in the end, use this thing they've created in other ways. It's like, it's, they're not, I guess it's more, this is specifically for like popular artists. Um, but if they create a piece of music, they have an investment in it, right? And if they create a piece of music for us, solely us, and they can't do anything with, I feel like the artist may be less invested 
and actually making that all it could be, you know, and not to say that anyone's going out trying just to like do less work or anything, but if they do end up with some right to that music and they can use it and uh, kind of share it in their networks and know that they'll be able to monetize in some way and we both win because we get that artist, we get this great music and we also have them promoting the music and its connection to our own products. I think there's something really cool in that. It's kind of a win-win in my opinion. Yeah. Andrea, anything to add? Yeah. Um, I would say that for bands and like artists uh, who are a little bit more well-known, it's, it's easier to uh, get that <laughs> included in like a contract just because those are usually separated, like negotiated separately. separately. Um, but I think like in general for like just a normal uh, composer contract, you know, just for a typical game asset, it's not super common, at least from what I've seen, uh, to allow composers. And, you know, obviously I wish it were differently, but um, it, from a legal standpoint, I think it's, you know, obviously best for the company to like have less uh, liability as well as it's just, it makes things a little bit simpler for the whole buyout, you know, uh, buyout terms. Um, so that's generally what I've seen, um, but you know, maybe, maybe things will change. Uh, but yeah, that's in general, um, what I feel like is probably a little bit more of the norm. Very much my experience. Yeah, and I can say that. Andrew's describing. Oh, go ahead, James. So, yeah. I was, was going to say that uh, it definitely is the norm for buying out for composer pieces and that kind of thing. And perhaps I'm putting forward a bit of an idealized scenario, but, uh, mm -hmm. Both still have. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, and I, I just yeah. want to shed light on the reasoning too. From a developer perspective, they're purchasing this music, and if you can take and license it yourself into some other, you know, commercial, like what's to say you don't accidentally you license that into something that is maybe a little risque right. or off brand with a developer? You know, why yeah. would they take that risk of you being able to do this? And then everyone's like, oh, that's in, you know, this game, that developer supports, you know, something right. that they don't believe in. I, I think the level yeah. of risk is very high there yeah. for a developer and they're not usually willing to compromise in my experience on the ancillary uses. Um, but, right. but to kind of also just touch on things that I think are realistic for composers to keep, I think Chance mentioned the writer's share of the performance royalties. This is something we always try and get. We can usually get it. I do think with some companies, it can be difficult. I've heard this from a lot of um, other people as well to get legal teams to grant writer's share. So I do that even is sometimes a struggle, even if it's useless to the developer and publisher, teaching them that can be hard. Um, and then other uh, rights, you know, that to piggyback on Chance's common, comments as well, portfolio rights, making sure you write it into your contracts that you can use your music once the developer gives you permission uh, to put it on your website, to put it on social media. That's something you have to write in, very important. And also credit writing in i want to get credit in the project if you do um so yeah these are these are things that i think are very reasonable for sure and yeah pushing for these other things uh sounds great in the uh idealized future i love it cool um yes not just an idealized future this is happening it's not happening widespread but it is happening I, I'm so glad to hear that, honestly. That's great. Um, and, I, and I have honestly seen an improvement even in PRO rights over the last five years and everything in terms of people's willingness to, to give those up. So that, that's awesome to hear, Chance. Cool. All right. Um, this is a great question. I get this all the time personally. Do you think becoming a sound designer for games can be counterproductive if you also want to be a composer? So I guess kind of just stepping back and looking at the, mm -hmm. I want to be a composer. Should I also do sound design? Do I need to do both? Should I specialize in one or the other? Uh, Andra? <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, question. Yeah, I mean, it's because I, I also went through that, you know, I wanted to be a composer at a certain point and I was like, oh, maybe I should go into sound design. And I actually did fall in, in love with sound design. Um, but yeah, I think that it, it's hard. Like, I think if you, 
it's not to say it's not doable <laughs> because I think anything is doable. But, um, you know, once you go into sound design, it's a it's still a pretty different field from composing. Uh, and there are some some studios that let you compose and sound design. Uh, my first job at EA, I had that type of a role. Um, but yeah, I think it's just how much how much of a commitment you want to go into music, you know, um, because once you diverge into sound design, like, uh, you know, you won't be able to spend that much level of attention on your craft. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that there are multiple ways of getting into the industry, getting into the project and the game you want to work on. Um, so yeah, that is a viable option. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there are just sacrifices that have to be made um, <laughs> if you do do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's possible. So yeah. Yeah, and, and if I am a sound designer, if I'm applying for a sound design position at high res, um, and right. then you open up my reel and it's richardludlowmusic.com and you see some sound design and you see some music. Is that a red flag for you that maybe this person wants to be a composer and they're trying to dupe you and get in? Maybe I'm triggered. <laughs> but uh, so, thoughts? Yeah. Um, I would does that recommend Does that negatively the... affect your application? Okay. I, yeah, I think that if you are applying for a sound design role and you focus and highlight music, I think that would be de like more detrimental to that just because like I... I'm like, what is your focus, right? What is your attention on? Um, and, and, you know, you may be brilliant at both of them, right? But at a certain point, like, uh, you know, present your best foot forward for the opportunity that you're trying to apply for, right? And, and you know, if they're like, oh, I'm not really sure what this person is about, right? Like, then, you know, it, it just makes it harder to see if this is the right person for the role. Totally. James, yeah. thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If there's if you're applying for a particular role, only show that role. You don't need to show anything else. It is confusing for sure. And I've experienced that before. Where you're like, wow, oh, this is a very well-rounded person, but what is the intent? What are they trying to really show here? Their their versatility or their actual passions? I definitely think like the pigeonhole comment kind of comes into this as well. Like, it's a meritocracy, really, and if if you spend all your time doing sound design or all your time doing music, uh, you're going to become known for one of those pieces. And once again, you're just going to start getting more uh, asks for that particular area. So if music is your focus and you love sound design, make I mean, sound design, but make music that uses your sound design skills, right? Like really get into the sound design aspect of that. If you, uh, if you just love like strange, a total creations, like, that is musical as well. You can like go off on it in so many ways, but but definitely put it into one of those places. I definitely spent a lot of time doing both, and not that I regret it, but uh, from all all my years doing sound design, I recognized that I got more. I was known as a sound designer, and then I was like, okay, I got to back this up and like spend a lot of time focusing on music, so people start thinking of me of that in that way. Yeah, no, good advice. Chance Thanks. thoughts? Can I add something to this part of the discussion? It's fascinating to me to hear about Andrea's experience, that she originally thought about being a composer, but also learned sound design. She ended up as an audio director. That is not a unique experience. Many of my friends who started out, especially on mobile games or indie games, and had to do sound and music, eventually they acquire enough skill that they can direct the whole audio side of development. And I think it's great training for, for your future, you know, for somebody who wants to be an audio director at some point. Yeah, no, that, that, that's great advice. Very cool. Um, yeah, let me see here. We got a lot of great questions coming in. So, um, yeah, kind of stepping back in the process, when do you get involved with, or when do you involve composers or become involved? Is that early on, toward the end? What a point are you engaging a composer? And maybe we keep this one a little briefer, but um, unless you want to add anything particular, but um, James? Yeah, um, there's a few points to get involved. Pretty much as soon as a feel or some general ideas about a project have been developed, I like to get personally involved just to get a sense of the roadmap. Like, 
how complex is what we're what the team asking for? Um, so just so we can start planning. Um, but at that point, you know, maybe there's some back and forth just to supply some material that that uh, may support whatever they're building, just to create a pallet. Uh, after that, it's not really. I'll step away again until we get into like pre-pro early production, and that's when you start getting to the real meat of it. And piggybacking off this, James, how much of that development of the the musical systems and how much music is going to be needed, where all of that, and you know, interactive systems, how much of that is stuff that EA or your teams are kind of dictating to the composer and saying, here's what we'd like to do, fill in the gaps here, versus going to a composer and saying, do you have any thoughts on the interactive music and having them contribute to the design of it? Where is that balance for you guys? I'd, I'd say initially it's 50-50, right? We come in with, here's their ideas. Uh, what do you think? And that's kind of part of the exploration of how familiar the composer is with interactive music, what ideas they can yeah. bring. Like uh, we had Martin Stig Anderson on for an internal talk um, earlier on in the year and we, obviously everyone was like, well, tell us a little bit about control. And that's like, that's such an extremely integrator heavy style piece, right? It's like, it's real time generative music, really. Um, and that's the kind of thing you need to plan for very, very early in the process or have someone who's yeah. just, their head is so in that space. But if it's more linear pieces, then, then it doesn't have to be a big conversation. For sure. You can go later. So Andrea, later. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I would say... Uh, first, part, first part of the question oh. being, how often do you typically bring someone in? And then second part being, and you know, when you're working with them, what does your ideas versus their ideas, how does that gel? Yeah, I would say it is helpful to bring them in like once the art is kind of like finalized in terms of a specific direction because that helps with inform the aesthetic and the type of music that you want to go for. Um, and also it's you know helpful to have like a main theme right because it provides some kind of music branding for your game and helps inform the personality um, and the emotions that people are supposed to feel and you know it, it breathes life into the game I, I know that a lot of times people are like oh now this is like the identity of the game once i hear the music it like clicks right and so um i would say having like making a big splash in the beginning to kind of help with like a lot of the identity of the game is important. And then later on, um, you know, probably once the game mechanics are a bit more fleshed out and the levels are more fleshed out, then getting into the nitty gritty of the specifics of like where in the game you need certain events to play. Makes sense. So tweaking this yeah, question I, slightly for chance. <laughs> oh, go ahead, James. I, I was just going to say that I've definitely done both like i think what andrew uh, andrea is suggesting is, is awesome way to go but i've certainly experienced a few titles where it went really strong in one way and then all of a sudden shifted and it was like okay i guess yeah. we're starting over again so <laughs> yeah it's, you got, you got to be very, very sensitive to the production right yeah like just got a sense yeah of however much feeling about it and um, be very aware of the direction of the product but um I mean, it's always amazing yeah. to have music that really supports the vibe, whatever it is. Um, being able to pivot right. is where it gets a little tricky. And I think that's where Chance's comment about the rabbit hole thing can get a little, you can start exhausting your rabbit holes. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, tweaking this slightly for Chance, when do you like to be brought into a project, Chance? And then second follow-up would be, when do you actually, in reality, usually get brought in for the project? I think every person who wants to have a creative contribution to a game wants to be involved as early as possible, right? Because you want your to not only gel itself because of the input you're receiving, but sometimes the music ideas that you present to the developer help them in other parts of game development. Um, and the reality that I've experienced over almost 30 years in this business is that you tend to get brought in early if it's a highly adaptive score. And um, there's a lot of interactive elements that you have to develop with the team. You tend to get brought in in the last three months or so if 
um, most of the music that you're contributing is just um, a single or a layered loop and a few stingers. Yeah, yeah that's totally. a good point. For us, I actually, uh, on, our, on our projects that don't require, you know, a year of highly engaging interactive work, I personally like to tell our clients to bring us in as early as they can and have an initial discussion. And then we just usually sit in their Slack for like six to nine months and do a meeting every two or three months and kind of check in on where things are. And that kind of like generally informs small changes that are good for them. They'll be like, oh, we didn't think about that. We'll do that next. But then I like to wait to start um, until later because things just change. People are like ready to give me their like entire game walkthrough, like every first meeting. And I'm like, maybe it's going to change. You don't. You, Maybe. And, you know, by the time you get to it, like half the time, whatever we got pitched like six months ago is totally different. So for me, I like to wait and start um, when we have the time available, but be there early on to be a part of the discussion. Cool. Richard? Um, yes. Hey, Richard. I, I do need to um, head out. Just It's on purpose. Yes, no problem, Chance. Bail whenever you need. Do you have time for one question, Chance? I'm going to say the question. Maybe Chance will hear it. Maybe he'll respond. Maybe he'll disappear. Uh, great question here, Chance. This was for you specifically. I compose music for indie games and prefer to retain my rights, but it sounds like you also make those deals with larger projects. How do you market the music after it's been released? And again, if you need to bail, no worries. Um. So I have a couple of different primary channels. I have my own record company, Huge Sound Records, and I have an online soundtrack gallery. And so I put the music up there to, um, to purchase as individual tracks or the album. I also distribute digitally to Apple Music, to Spotify, to YouTube, to all of the digital music outlets. And... Um, then one of the things I've tried is I have these periodic seminars um, with myself, with Pinka, with, with different, you know, uh, people who are successful in the business. And the cost of attendance is buying an album. And that's been an interesting approach. We've gotten some music distributed that way. Um, but those are my primary outlets. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes total sense. Awesome. And yeah, thank you so much again, Chance, for, for contributing. I know you got to bail here any second. So um, really been great to have you. Great perspective. I'll try and fill in the composer's perspective when you're gone. And, and I've cool. loved um, hearing from James and Andrea and also you, Richard. Thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. Awesome. Bye. Cool. Good chance. <laughs> All right, carrying on. Um, Follow-up question to what we were talking about before. This is a great question, I think. Can someone draw a clear enough line between their sound design and music portfolios on their website um, and you know, kind of eliminate that red flag of this is a composer, sound designer, they don't know what they want to do, or maybe they aren't, you know, whatever. Can they have both of them in a way on their site uh, presented well? And I'll answer this question first um, for me. We hire a lot of sound designers and um, often there's music. I never eliminate a sound designer based on seeing that they are interested in music and have music on their portfolio. I always listen to their deal because we have um, hired in the past excellent composers who have done sound design. I will say it's a very tiny minority in my experience, uh, but I never would personally eliminate someone based on that, but it would make me question and ask specific questions in their interview to try and ferret out if what their ultimate you know, goal is, what they personally want to do. Um, Andrea? Yeah, I would just say, make it really clear on your website. Maybe just like, this is my sound design reel, and then this is my music reel, right? So that like, I have like a specific place I can go to if I want to look at your sounds, right? And I have a specific place to look at if I want to listen to your music. Um, and then, yeah, and then hopefully that should just, you know, get rid of any confusion there. Um, but yeah, I agree with... Um, yeah, Richard, in terms of like, you know, it's just because you do music or just because you do sound, it doesn't like mean that we won't consider you for one or the other. 
for sure. James? Yes, certainly that makes sense as well. And I think, um, I mean, having, as audio people, we generally have a lot of crossover. I find most audio people I know, they dabble in both sides anyways. And so I think going back to my comment earlier, when you're applying for a particular position, make the that the the role the focus of what you're presenting but you definitely want to include all the other pieces like the what else you do and your involvement i mean everyone can make use of uh, a well-rounded artist for sure and uh, i'd say even like an indie title might even want someone who is really well versed in both areas you know like, like you're the primary Absolutely. audio stakeholder you're going to be doing everything so uh, it kind of depends who you're approaching totally Totally agree. This is a great question. I don't know if anyone's going to have a great answer, but with COVID restrictions, how would you suggest composers network or find developers or publishers? Uh, I people, A lot of people have asked me this in the last year, and my answer has always been, I'm so sorry, I don't have a good answer. Um, I know that a lot of conferences have moved online, and they have improved even their meeting booking systems. So... For me, I guess my initial reaction would be find the conferences with developers, see if they have a good, robust meeting system that would enable you to message and set up meetings with people that you're genuinely interested in attending. Um, for me, I've still found that personal connection is really important and just kind of, you know, blindly sending things into the void or posting on Facebook or whatnot hasn't been effective for me. But um, yeah, thoughts, uh, James? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you just got to go with whatever you can. Uh, conferences are great. Everyone's there for a reason, and it's the same reason as you. It's to learn, but it's also to make those connections. It is not as organic now as it was in the past, but getting involved in the chats, asking these questions, uh, reaching out to the presenters afterwards. Like Most people, including myself, are really open to the conversation after the fact. And I think that's almost where there's probably more value if you get more specific answers to your specific questions. So definitely you got to put the legwork in or I guess the finger work nowadays just to stay connected with everyone and, and keep that going. Way more valuable when someone sends me uh, a piece of music that they want like the, my thoughts on. And I try to go to, I, like, I go out of my way to, res to listen and respond to everything that's sent to me because I want people to understand what my needs are. Like, I, I don't want to, hold back anything really if i think a piece of music has potential but there's something that would make me not choose it i'm very happy to be honest about it and uh in, with kindness <laughs> yeah that that that's a great point and i think it's an important reminder for people that a lot of people really are willing to respond to your your emails or your inquiries but you need to be respectful of people's time and don't send them a list of 20 questions or like 50 tracks totally. that you want comments yeah. on. If you want to engage with someone, for me personally, I'm ha I respond to like every email, but I, I I will respond and say like, sorry, I'm not going to take the time to answer this because you've sent me 30 questions or something, but I'll answer one. So I just think you know, crafting very focused messages where you can really you know engage with someone on be respectful of their time, you're going to get the better results. But um, yeah, Andrea, thoughts. I think it's, well, as an introvert, I think it's actually easier now with like the virtual <laughs> pandemic stuff because I'm I like, love it. I love know. this for a second. Go on. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I like mean, a I lot hate of people, the... believe me, I hate going out to a bar and things. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it's just easier. I'm like, oh, and then like, they don't need a business card, their link is right there. And I can just click and then, you know, and, and also the meetups, like, uh, <clears throat> if you go to a conference, sometimes there is a risk that you won't be able to get the, get to meet the people that you need to meet or want to meet, right? Um, but then yeah. I think it's a bit more predictable with the virtual stuff. Um, if you can get in contact with someone, you know, or Twitter, right? Twitter, I think, is a good medium to interact with people in an informal way and kind of try to develop rapport with them, um, you know, and like, yeah, kind of like foot in the door type thing and then you know you can follow up later on um you know linkedin and all of those different platforms i think are all viable <laughs> places to talk to people virtually great great point great advice uh cool um got another question here uh specifically about sound design there's been a few questions about this entry level sound design i know we have a lot of sound designers watching um 
number one and two skills that you would want to see out of a sound designer that you're looking to hire? Andrea first, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say like wise uh, knowledge and competency and blue blueprints and unreal competency, like the implementation side of things. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that also just is often not talked about is just instincts too, like having a good ear and being able to hear if something is good or bad. And um, a lot of times you can determine that with an audio test. And so that's one way that I go about it is, you know, if I, I hire based on potential too, um, you know, they may not have like all the experience in the world, but I think if they, if they have a good ear and they have good sensibilities and they have like knowledge of, you know, how to implement, um, then yeah, I mean, I think there's a good chance that you'll be able to produce good, a good audio test. And hopefully that's a good sign that, you know, this is going to be a good hire worth investing in. Cool. I don't know how much yeah. you do this, James, but anything to add? <laughs> yeah, um, it always crosses over a bit. Definitely ear is the first thing that jumps out at me. If you can produce a linear rear, uh, reel that actually is has narrative quality and subtlety and nuance through it all, then perks the interest immediately. After that, if you can show that you actually have experience with the tools, um, that's the, the other 50%. But primarily, it's like, do you know or can you produce something that sounds really good? <laughs> yeah. If you no, can do that, then you can fix, fix the rest, right? And I think it all, yeah, like, that, 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 you can have somebody who's very implement, have implementation heavy and they can grow towards it. But uh, it's definitely a bit easier when someone can just produce something that right off the bat can grab your attention. And uh, I mean, the complexities of integrating and uh, sound design in games is like, it's mind blowing. You can go so deep into it. Totally. Let's talk about reels for a second, because I think it's a great topic. Mm -hmm. What is a good reel, both for a composer and a sound designer? And I guess I'll, I'll go first for us. Um, you know, it depends on the position we're hiring for. We have like seven in-house full-time composers. So that's a bit unusual for to have like double, W2 salaried composers. But for us, um, we are generally hiring orchestral composers. And so we have people upload their, their three to five best tracks in this style. Um, we give them a little blurb about that. And then, and then we do, you know, blind evaluations based on that um, for our, for our composers. If it's a, if it's a music reel on a website though, um, I think it's very important that you enable someone to click through and see everything you're offering and not just offer one giant video that maybe is like 15 minutes long with like 10 different tracks not clearly spaced out throughout it because i want to be able to say oh great here's 10 tracks and i can kind of see a variety of styles and it's a little harder as one giant reel but um but that that's just me personally i don't know if um james thoughts um, i'm always into one reel with chapters because um, i like just to throw it up and then click through and it, as i'm going if something grabs my ear then i Mm -hmm. see what it is, find out what it is, and kind of dial into that. Because especially, uh, I mean, there's so many styles someone might want to hit, right? They may be like, here's my yeah. orchestral piece, and here's my more electronic piece, and here's a hybrid thing. And, you know, being able to, like, quickly click through, even just so if I'm looking for something specifically, like, I'm only interested in hybrid score right now. That's all I want to look at. Yeah. If there's a way for me to isolate that stuff, then that's really helpful. Yeah, that makes and sense. And one piece is because it's simpler reels. to deal with. Okay, yeah. Sound, uh, design, sound design, I, I guess that's a little trickier. It's harder to define. Um, Easier for me, that's fine. Yeah. But go on. <laughs> yeah, well, tell me what your thoughts are, because for me, I would watch for, for it. For me, I want to see guess... linear. Yeah, mm -hmm. for me, you oh, know, yeah. it's, it's very difficult in my mind to, to take like an 8-bit game in your reel and know what that should sound like because you could have interpreted it one way there's so in magic as well there's so many different interpretive ways um of like 
designing sound that, that can have a cool outcome. But for me, I really love seeing something that's cinematic with humans running around or whatnot, or, or just something where you have an expectation of the sound based on all the years of movies and, and games that we've engaged in. And I want to know, can you create something when it has an yeah. expectation of what it should sound like. If it's totally abstract, it's really hard for me to know, are you gonna be able to create something when you have to replicate a specific element? And, and so that is what I love to see um, personally. But um, yeah, Andrea? Um, yeah, I think it's a great question uh, for music. I think it's important just the first five seconds of every track that you decide to feature on there, make sure like that's the catchiest, the best, because, you know, people may just listen to the first couple of seconds. And then, you know, if they're interested, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'll listen more. Right. But most of the time you just want to browse um, production quality, I think, is just really important. And a lot of times understated, uh, you could be a really great composer. But if the synthestration and is not there, um, you know, it could affect how people perceive your music. Um, if you can get live players to record on them, I would probably feature those songs maybe earlier or closer to the beginning of the demo. Um, I would say for sound design stuff, yeah, I also agree. I think a cinematic is awesome. And if you can try to flex a bit, <laughs> uh, maybe like action scenes or things that require a lot of um, detail or just like the amount of sound design is a little bit more intensive. Uh, I would probably showcase those. Um, I think re-sound designs are great, you know, because, uh, you know, it really challenges you and you can put your own spin on things. Um, but yeah, I think that those are probably good places to start for that. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. And just to clarify, because I know there's a question. Yes, when we say sound design, we're also talking about sound effects. So uh, generally, right. I think when we're talking about a sound designer here, we're not talking so much about a musical sound designer as someone creating, you know, gunshots, spells, whatnot. Obviously, there's crossover, so don't mean to blanket generalize. But in these specific instances, just to clear that up. Um, yeah. And then there's also a question here about, you know, if you're a sound designer and you are, uh, you have reels for sound design and technical sound design, should those be the same? Should those be separate? My answer would be, I definitely want to see those separate. It's awesome if you designed the sounds in your technical test. That's fantastic, obviously ideal. But I, I think there's only so far you can take a technical test in terms of showing off some things. There's just certain things you can't do when it's an implementation uh, demo versus a purely linear cinematic experience. So I do think for me, it's important to have two. I like to see both. If you're applying for a position where you're expected to do both as as a you know key feature of the job. Uh, I don't know if anyone would have anything to add to that. Yeah, I would agree. I think like make your reel as modular as possible. It would be good to like you know have clear distinctions: sound design, right? Technical sound design, composition, um, just so that there's no confusion, right? And you your skill set is clearly demoable without hiding behind the other things like right like your music isn't overshadowed by a bunch of explosion sounds right um mm -hmm. but yeah i think for technical sound design something that i do like seeing is um does this person like to be curious about things do they have their own projects too where they, like you know almost like r d type projects like uh even if it's not completely related to wise or unreal right like it could be just like oh, I decided to make my own microphone or something, you know? Um, anything that shows that, like, I uh, I am not just interested in, like, A, B, and C, like, just the normal theoretical, typical stuff, but, you know, showing some curiosity into exploration because I think that is a big part of technical sound design, which is, like, you know, can you problem solve, right? And not everything will be a linear thing with technical issues. <laughs> Troubleshooting totally. is a big part. Right? Yeah. Anything to add, James? Just the one thought that came up there um, is that if you do have a section that puts everything together, uh, there, there is still value there. Like having, ha being able to have a piece where they have the music and they have sound design and the full mix experience. Um, 
it definitely speaks a lot to kind of a, a high level view of, the, of how someone will produce a product. So there's something really valuable mm -hmm. there as well. Like we want to hear the like the details and the individual elements, but when it all puts comes together, uh, coming back to like the ear, right? If someone has kind of a vision and they can get it across and know when you know music should be like pulling back or when sound effects just fall away because it supports narrative, um, that's definitely really valuable as, as well, depending on the, the actual role. Totally, yeah. And I want to acknowledge there's been some great questions coming in about PRO rights and also uh, content ID. We kind of had a discussion beforehand and agreed like this isn't something everyone is an expert on here. So I'm going to just pass on those questions, but didn't want people to think they were ignored. Uh, they're great questions for a different set of panelists, a different day. Um, cool. Um, thoughts on in a reel rescoring an existing game. I've heard a lot of conflicting opinions on this, honestly, from people on the on the reviewing side of the table. For me, with sound, I love it. Fantastic. Do what the game did. Do something totally different. I don't really care. It should just sound great. If it's what the game style that you were emulating, I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You're able to emulate the style of this game really well. If you do something totally unique, I'm like, wow, that was a great bent on... Uh, you know, something something different. But I will say for me, if you're gonna rescore in the style of the project or redesign in the style of the project, it better be freaking great because uh, <laughs> if, you're, if you're trying to emulate what they did, I'm gonna be comparing it to that. So for that reason, I do think a lot of people kind of put their own twist on it, which can kind of free you of being tied to the shackles of the original amazing score or sound. But um, thoughts, uh, James? Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it I totally agree. Like as soon as you're re rescoring or resound designing a piece, there's that immediate, you know, A B in everyone's mind. They're like, what was the original? And then they look at yours. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like there's, uh, sorry, it's not necessarily a bad thing if the quality isn't quite on par. It depends a lot on the position. Like if you have an entry level sound design position or a music position, then everyone takes that into account. And I think the same thing is said about. Uh, like like tests, like sound design tests. So say we give you a reel and you have a weekend to do the best you can in that time. I don't think the expectation is that it's going to like be better than the original that they spent six months on. That'd be ridiculous. But it's more just to get a sense of what you think is the most important part of this and, and how you approach it. And we have the conversation afterward in the interview process. So I think it's... I think everyone is aware of what you're putting forward compared to the others. And it's all kind of, it's a weird juggling act going on there between uh, our expectations for the role and uh, what you present. And, and then just talking to you about their actual process when we go through the interview process. Totally. That makes sense. Andrea? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... I would probably not do it. Just, I mean, like, I think, well, you can do it, but I think it's risky, right? Like, I, but, you know, so it's like if you want to take the risk or not, right? Like, I think it depends on the person listening to it, right? Like, they may be nice about it and they may have, like, nice expect, like, they they may be more understanding and be like, okay, you know, this is an entry-level role. But then there's also these just pre-existing associations that people have with the original score where... Um, mm -hmm. I guess, like, what is your your goal from doing that, right? Like, um, you know, th it's just hard not to compare, right? Um, yeah. And at a certain point, like, it makes sense for sound design because you need some totally. something to go off of, right? Like, visually for the sound to go off of. But for music, you know, you can't, you have, like, the sky is the limit type thing, right? And I, for me, I think it might be, less risky and just maybe you have more creative freedom if you just write your own track, right? Like, um, and yeah, I don't think it helps narrative. you with music as much as it does with sound. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. There's more chance yeah, for it to hurt you potentially. Well, go Yeah. James, uh, I'd say it. with music, honestly, like I could see an argument. I could see arguments from both sides, right? Because I've definitely seen demos where people have gone a completely different way musically to the original. And if it's more a demonstration of, how you can manipulate our emotions by changing the music. And it's something I'm really interested in in general is how music 
instructs the narrative. It directs it in this kind of wonderful subconscious way. So I've seen demos for people like maybe the original was like just a full on like da da like blow your head off kind of experience, and someone did a they went more subtle with it and they made it more emotional and more empty and it creates a totally different sensation. And if they've gone to the trouble to work with sound design or anything other other elements there to support it, I, I find that very interesting because you're you're really creating a world with music and sound design and and you can change the whole perspective just by changing the sounds you use and uh, I, I'm all for it because I recognize well I try to recognize what the intent is and if there are problems with it then so be it maybe those are those are learning points for the for the artist but uh, I'm always looking for how what you're trying to do when it, when it comes to narrative, especially for music. So I don't mind it if it doesn't, if it's not, sorry, I don't mind there being an A-B comparison personally. I think this is a great example of you're going to get a different answer from anyone you yeah. ask this question to. Oh, so it's kind yeah. of, a, you know, you're, you're screwed. Everybody is screwed. Just you know, there's no good answer here. Some people love <laughs> one thing, some people love another, and you never know who you're sending it to. Well, yeah, it's, it's like, like a chase, big your, risk, chase your passion. Big risk, big risk, big reward type thing, right? If you can pull it off, yeah. like kudos to you, right? Um, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I think regardless though, if you're crafting a reel and you've got a music demo page of your website, uh, safe to assume it's good to do both if you if you have both and you think that it is putting your best foot forward with, with a rescore, you know, also have some separate tracks. I just, I wouldn't, you know, if you have both and you're proud of both and think they both are doing good, showcase both because as you can see whoever this ends up in their inbox they might like one thing they might like another and this lets them kind of pick um i think yeah. you the key point cool. there richard is that whatever you're the most proud of is the piece you want to showcase like there's no expectation other than that like just put the thing that puts you in the best light i think great advice yeah cool um excellent i have i have some notes being typed to me here from the virtual uh, audio kinetic gods virtual and goddesses. Assistant. Yes, yes, it's amazing. Uh, but anyway, yeah, no, th this has been fantastic. I, we had some really good questions we didn't get to, which makes me sad. But um, <laughs> thank you both so much. I guess I'll just wrap up with, you know, uh, I think a lot of people watching are, are, you know, freelance composers or sound designers kind of looking to to, to start getting their foot in the door at a place or to start scoring their first project um, uh, or furthering their career. Thoughts on any advice you would give since this was a music panel? Let's go specifically to composers um, kind of looking to do that um, today. There's no advice. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would say, I can go uh, first. Like, Let me, I'll um, go first. What do you guys think? I'll go okay, first. What do you guys think? So for, for me, uh, I guess, you know, piggybacking off uh, the fact that most of my relationships with our clients have come from personal connections, it's diff tough to do now, but I would try and further that. And if I was thinking about this as a, as a composer, for me, that honestly might be tracking down some games that I see are, you know, and, uh, announced, but coming out deep in the future and, and sending just a very brief but crafted message, you know, expressing my own love of the project. I wouldn't blast this out. Don't blast out emails to like 500 developers ch ch shotgun style, hoping you're going to get like, you know, responses for me, personal connections. If I've expressed, there have been times when I have seen a game and written the developer a heartfelt email about like how much I loved what I saw in their trailer and um and not even mentioned music or sound and then they've been like oh i clicked on the link in your signature and and we've worked together so i i, I think it's it's tough but i think personal connections for me are what i have seen uh, advance most people's careers and um you know that's one way of kind of reaching out that comes to mind for me thoughts andrea um i would say that like you know uh don't give up on it because it's even though it's not an easy path like if you really want it you will make progress on it and i think that a lot of times uh it is like about the mindset and you know setting uh reasonable expectations right like um you know you may not be able to be Hans zimmer right like but like you know, set goals for year one, right? Like, what do you want to accomplish, right? Um, and and then actionable steps on how to get there, um, so that 
you know, and even you may not hit the, those goals and that's okay, but at least you have like a plan and you're working towards it. Um, you know, there's the craft part, right? Like obviously right every day, it's like working out, right? You don't want to have flabby music muscles, right? Um, so uh -huh. the, the theory, <laughs> the theory part that. of it is um, important, right? Make sure your theory is there, make sure your, your production is there, right? Um, so those would be things to keep on practicing on. Um, and then the other bucket is obviously the networking and the, um, and then I would say a fourth one actually would be like the business part of it, you know, cause uh, you, you have to know how to interact with clients. You have to know how to bill, right? So informing yourself and, you know, like these sessions are good, right? Like where you um, expand your knowledge on how to like uh, present yourself, right? You're real and how to talk to people, right? And force yourself to like maybe do one of those every month or, you know, set an actionable goal where you can be actively um, tackling like each of those each of those categories um, throughout the year, or at least regularly. <laughs> Great advice. Great advice. James, yeah. you got a lot to live up to. Yeah, that's so solid. Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree. I, I, it's really about, there's just, I'm just trying to like break it down, simplify a bit, because I feel like there's so many paths, but definitely being strategic, um, making sure that you have those connections and you keep you keep feeding them, right? You keep reaching out in a, in a way that's that's respectful for sure for of people's time. Um, f uh, never give up, absolutely. Like I've worked with, uh, like but wanted I've wanted to work with artists for years and haven't been able to work with them yet because the right project hasn't come up. But it can take that long, and it's interesting too because like a project like well, like at EA, there's quite a few projects going on but they also have a massive pool of artists to draw on. So you never know when your moment is, is going to arrive. And it could be, it could just be a small piece that supports, uh, right? Like, uh, like a bigger title, or it could be the whole thing. You never, you really never know. So you never give up. You keep working on the, the piece of, of the, your music that is passionate to kind of establish yourself as, you know, a master of this particular domain. And as those relationships build, you know, you get more opportunity that way. So that's kind of a more general idea. But I think what Andrew, Andrea said was, uh, was perfect. Yeah, oh, no, I, I think that's thing. a great point. Oh, yeah. One other really important thing, I think, as an artist, have a buffer with the money conversations. If you have an agent or someone else, you can handle all that. Get yourself out of any conversations about money and your need to do the gig that is a huge piece i think generally for artists and i'm sure most people have that sorted but for those of you who are just getting started and want to try and do everything just get away from any of that conversation all you want to focus on is the creation of the art yeah that's fair that's a whole nother panel too but uh yeah no th this is yeah. great yeah i think everybody you know there's a lot of paths here you can you can work for another composer you can work in-house you can be a freelancer there's a lot of paths they all take different timelines it's tough to know how long it'll take for for either any path but um there's a lot of a lot of things going on andrea james thank you both so much for making your time this is great i think there was a lot of insightful information that people are going to love um and uh yeah simon Thanks for having us. <laughs> well, Thank thanks for moderating the panel. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, James. Thank, thanks, Chance, as well, that had to leave. Um, yeah. Great stuff. I, I took a lot of notes. We're running out of time because I also had some questions. But there's one thing that maybe oh, no. that caught my attention. No, no, not a question, but sure. maybe something for another panel in the future or, or presentation where basically, in essence, the music, the question about implementation, and of course, we're biased with whys and everything is about implementation, right? So, <laughs> but, but generally, the, the question was, well, it's not essential. It's good to know those tools, but it's not essential to do your own implementation and so on. Where a bit later, Andrea was asked about sound design and the very first thing she was saying, like, you have to, <laughs> to know why, and you have to know Unreal and, and so on. So, yeah. so what makes sound design, is it like more important? Is it the complexity of it? Is it because it's more in-house people typically mm -hmm. that are working on sound design implementation? So 
I don't know, but maybe yeah. maybe a, a topic for uh, for a next uh, event uh, like that. Yeah, sounds great. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a good question. Yeah, and I, yeah. I do think you know at a broad, at a high level, you are hitting something a nail on the head there with the in-house thing. You know, it's, there's a lot going on with integration and people releasing access to their projects and things like that, and who's mucking about in Perforce. So I, I do think the in-house thing yeah. is certainly an element. Yeah, and yeah, I, definitely. yeah, and I definitely think that also a game has to have sounds too, right? Otherwise, <laughs> they have no feedback if they're doing well or not. So I think that's a big part of it. It's like, how can you get the sound in the game? Oh, you have to use Wise to implement it, right? Or, or, uh, you know, or natively. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. great, yeah. great. So thank you one more time uh, for hosting that, for entertaining, for bringing all. Like very good advice. Uh, I think it fell also into bringing people from outside games into the game business and ideas how to break in, which is in essence the spirit for for that thing. Um, oh. So uh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you very much again uh, for your for your contribution today. Definitely. Um, Thank you much for having us. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna take a five-minute break again, and next we'll have Joe Twaits talking about the music implementation for uh, Sackboy, a big adventure. So uh, stay tuned with us. In about five minutes, we'll be back. All right, see you.